Welcome, and this evening we will be speaking about Helmand River area in Afghanistan and all the different anomalies as experienced by our guest tonight, Mike. Marine Special Forces spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and uh, sounds like it is quite the place for the preternatural. All right, episode three of Preternatural Interviews. I got Mike here with me. He's got a um, really interesting story. Just uh, context to the story is extremely uh, intriguing. And then the meat of the story is extremely intriguing. It's like some uh, AM, PM chicken meat. You're just like, you know what? Looks flavorful. I don't know what it is. Seems kind of dangerous. I'm in. <laughs> so, uh, Mike, uh, you're uh, telling me that you have a pretty unique story, um, both in the biography <laughs> of, uh, of uh, the story and in the actual specific events. And uh, from there, I'm going to let you go ahead and, and take it from here because you could tell it better than I could, I'm sure. All right. Thanks, John. I appreciate you letting me be a part of the project. Uh, I think it's great what you're doing. You know, the more you talk to different people from different walks of life, you find uh, when the subject comes up, the preternatural or the paranormal, that almost everybody can relate on some level or another, some facet. Uh, my particular experience centers around my military service. Uh, I spent 10 years in the Marine Corps, eight of which were spent with Marine Special Operations Command. Uh, I was an 0372 critical skills operator. One of my many deployments uh, was to Afghanistan to the Helmand River Valley. And uh, obviously no secret to anyone, a lot of fighting, very kinetic, uh, a lot of blood letting, a lot of loss of life. Uh, so very rich uh, area for opportunities of the, uh, the preternatural paranormal variety. Uh, so my particular team uh, was tasked with a village stabilization operation which is basically you send one team out into Indian country to set up a platform in order to build that particular population, that village, uh, reinforce them with finance, build up their infrastructure, uh, train and stand up a militia force that's capable of protecting themselves. Uh, and now they can in turn fight alongside coalition forces against the enemy, in this case being the Taliban or on terrorism. Uh, so it's a very austere environment. Uh, the team, my particular team, 12-man team special operators augmented by about seven enablers, uh, you know, explosive ordnance disposal, dog handler types, so on and so forth. Um, so as stated out there in Indian country. So once we arrived at the site, uh, which was located in the Helmand River Valley, can't disclose exact locations, but to give you an but, idea. But strategically is extremely... This, historically, the Helmand River is who, he who controls that controls, but all, all the goods coming in, like everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. Being one of the main waterways in uh, heavily vegetated areas for crop growth, whether that be poppy, the main export, or uh, any other any other uh, foods or uh, you know farm type agriculture type activities. Very densely populated, and yeah, absolutely, a lot of fighting dating back literally hundreds and hundreds of years. And and and, uh, and it, it's some level ground surrounded by a, lot, a mountainous region, or is it foothills, or is it very mountainous itself? Well, it's uh, it's a very interesting topography. Uh, it's not what you would think when you think of a desert uh, tundra type setting. It's actually very heavily vegetated, almost jungle-like, uh, wow. single canopy, somewhat double canopy in some locations. Okay. Uh, you got mountains that butt up uh, to your uh, east, and then on the western side of the Helmand River Valley, you've got the majority at that time, the Taliban strongholds and positions uh, all up and down the Helmand River itself. Um, climate ranges anywhere from relatively cold, you know, low, uh, low 60s, 50s in the evenings, all the way up to, you know, 90 plus degrees. Um, 
fighting season, as it's referred to, is spring because that's when, uh, you know, quite frankly, Afghan people, whether they're um, coalition forces, militia, Taliban, whatever, that seems to be their uh, their flavor for fighting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so at any rate, that's kind of uh, where we were at and how that uh, that that scene is set. When I first arrived, when my team first arrived at the site to uh, replace the team that was out going through a rip with them, <clears throat> we arrived at night um, and we're all pretty tired and strung out from traveling because we've been in country kind of bouncing all over the place. Uh, so we got there, we, we just immediately jumped into replacing all of their equipment with our equipment and the turnover and you know, the myriad of tasks that had to, that had to take place. Uh, so that first night slept pretty heavily. Um, you know, no, no issues, no problems. Just business as usual. The teams getting set up. Well, at what time of year was this? Um, uh, this was, was was fight season. This was just towards the beginning of summer. Um, you know, we were on the on the tail end of spring. So, okay. the team we replaced was very kinetic. Uh, they had been having their ins and outs with uh, the Taliban, and uh, you know, they did conduct some raids and some HPTs and some things of that nature. So. Okay. Pretty, pretty active site, pretty busy site. Um, first kind of real day that we got out into the public and interacted with some of the key leaders and village elders and you know, shot callers, some of the warlord types. Um, a bit of a fiasco, a bit of a circus. Everybody wanted to come around and see the new show in town, the new Marines, and try to get the, you know whatever they could get off of us. Um, but it, I mean, it was about what you would expect. You know, we're, we're, we're laying down our spiel about being here to buy with and through, help them liberate themselves, oppression of the Taliban and terrorism, yada, yada. The thing that kind of stood out to me uh, on that first day that was different than the ordinary was uh, some, some Afghan had managed to get himself stuck down in a well. Uh, <laughs> and after that, the whole thing's just kind of like, God, it's a friggin' circus already. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, as, as we're kind of talking to the elders and the village leaders, uh, we got reports that a group from outside had brought a local national and Afghan in and claimed he was possessed by ghosts. Okay. Uh, so immediately, you know, we're, we're already kind of chuckling about the guy in the well and that nobody <laughs> knows what to do about. It's like the, oh man. Yeah, it, uh, it's almost like, uh, reminds me of like Three Amigos when they get into town, but reverse, they're like, hey, we're here to do a picture or something. It's like you show up and it's like they're there to do a picture. Like, we got a guy in a well and another guy, uh, yeah. that's I my mean, ghost. Yeah, they just brought <laughs> all the monkeys out for the circus. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just distracting you. So at any rate, all of this is going on. And at, at some point, you know, we kind of wrap up um, our key leaders talking with their key leaders and moving out into uh, kind of a common area out along the main highway that ran near the BSO site that we were operating. You know, there's commotion, there's a big crowd in, uh, in and around one of the structures. Okay. And so, you know, come to find out through our guys that spoke the local language, the Pashtun language, and, uh, you know, some of the interpreters, that, you know, that's, that's the guy in there that uh, is possessed by ghosts. Okay. So, you know, curious, we all kind of go over and take a gander, not that we're, you know, can, what are we going to do about it? We're not here for that kind of thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, like Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah, so we go in and we look, and uh, I got to tell you, it was, uh, it was odd. First off, as soon as I walked into the structure, just very eerie feeling, mm. thick. Like, when the air is thick. Um, it's like pressing back down on you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, there's like a weight and just an uneasiness. And a smell too. Um, oh. You know, not not the uh, not the most fragrant part of the world. You know, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> yeah, you got some fermented bo, but sure. was that more like yeah. uh, like a dead meat smell or like blood, copper? Or? <sighs> you know, it, it it had a hint of uh, of rotting body, of dead body, which unfortunately I'm I'm pretty familiar with at this point. Yeah. Um, and it also had a hint of, uh, you know, like a burning, almost like I'd compare it, not that, you know, you really know what this, but like a thermite grenade, the way that sulfury burn kind of smells. Okay. Anyway. Almost like if like a transformer blew up nearby or something that you, you, yeah. you, you taste it and feel it in your nose a little bit. It stings your nose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Did that, so, so was it the translators that were telling you what was going on? They called it a ghost? They didn't call it a djinn? They referred to it as, it, you know, what we were getting from our guys that spoke Pashtun was he's being attacked and taken by ghosts. Um, I, I don't know specifically the terminology they used on their end, but that's wow. what we were getting out of the situation. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, so, right off the bat, going in, uh, it, it's just odd. Senses are kind of spiking. Not like, you know, they would in a dangerous situation, but just out of the ordinary. Yeah. Um, and I get a glance at this guy, and he's got a few people holding him down, and he's kind of twitching around a little bit. And the thing that shook me was the sound that was coming out of him. Um, at first, I thought there was like, you know, like a chicken or an animal in the room. And I actually remember looking around, like, what the hell is that noise? Mm. His teeth were chattering so fast and so loudly that it was making uh, like a really weird, audible sound for lack of a better term or, or means to describe like, it was no. it rhythmic or more chaotic like was it it was just groove? it was just really fast and repetitive oh, okay like very fast to where uh, i mean you, you you couldn't imitate it if you wanted to you know like almost yeah. like a seizure fast okay um blank expression eyes all the way dilated um yeah so just odd and we kind of you know we kind of took it with a <laughs> grain of salt like Hey, welcome to Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that, that was pretty much it for the day. It went by pretty uneventful and uh, with, without, any, without any further, anything further of note. Uh, the next thing that really stood out to me as odd, uh, at night around our compound, which was actually two or three different mud hut type compounds that we had co-opted into one, uh, in order to secure our stills and store all of our equipment and be able to defend our position. Um, it come to find out it was actually built right in front of an old cemetery or burial ground where they used to take their dead. Oh my uh, God. Didn't know that at first, but you know, we kind of figured <laughs> that out and went along. Yeah. Um, so yeah, at night, uh, on nights that there were not kinetic activities, gunfights and that kind of thing, uh, it was dead quiet. I mean, you could hear, everything, all the sounds of nature, all the animals, you know, the, the kind of rhythm of the night with all the crickets and all that kind of thing mm -hmm. being in a vegetated area. Uh, and especially under Nod's uh, night vision, uh, it's, it's just a, it's a really strange world, uh, really eerie. It doesn't, you know, the night vision doesn't define shadow very well. So you kind of think you may see movement and you'll vector in and you'll wait and you'll look, maybe hit it with an IR laser and, and Nothing there. No, no follow-on movement. Um, so you're just always kind of thinking things are moving and uh, just really eerie. Uh, and then I remember in particular, you know, once we had really started getting into uh, the fighting season and exchanges with the Taliban, uh, it seemed this type of occurrence began to rise in frequency. It was like an uptick in uh, dreams, really bad dreams. Well, so I remember one, uh, well, I mean, it happened on several occasions, but I remember the yeah. first time, one night in particular, that this took place, um, we each had our own separate little birthing areas within a wooden structure where we slept. And, uh, you know, I'm in mine. I've got the light off. I'm sleeping, uh, dead asleep. And, you know, the, uh, the sensation you get when somebody is right in your face? Yeah. Or when something is really close, you can tell that something is very close. You, you uh, can feel some bioenergy coming off of something so close that you're, you're yeah. interacting with it. Yeah. Right. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, whatever. For, for an easy way to test this is, is to take both your hands in a room and put them in front of your face. And you can kind of hear the, the way the sound changes in the room because now it's bouncing off of something in front of you. Oh, okay. You can just tell there's, I could just tell there was something very close to my face. Yeah. Uh, and immediate, like a malevolent feeling, uh, like, I'm in danger. This is terrifying. Uh, not sure if I'm dreaming or awake at this point. Can't see anything because the room's pitch black. Uh, and I always slept with my 45 loaded right next to my pillow. Um, <laughs> oddly enough, I had rehearsed how, you know, to grab the weapon and cover the door, which was over there. I'd gone through that a few times, you know, just, just in case kind of thing. So yeah. I thought, well, shit, here we go. This good a time as any to use it so I grabbed it hit the light on it on the uh, under rail and you know of course there's nothing in the room I'm like, uh, 
fucking, I've already been here too long. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that had that happened a couple of different times. That same scenario, a uh, really bad dream of, you know, being killed, friends being killed, and then waking up, uh, feeling something just just pressing down on me, looking right in my face, um, and I I could get the feeling of it really meant to do me harm, like whatever this was this energy uh does not like me in fact hates me mm -hmm. um and and yeah, that, that it's happened. probably tied to the land I, I would imagine yeah i i would have to agree i mean just given the history out there with the enough with the amount of uh fighting and death uh and, and reversal of land uh, i mean it, it just in the time that i was there um you know, people, it, quality of life is different. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they, they'll fight over not much. And then there, there are certain entities that we consider evil, but kind of are just doing their job. So wherever their soul is always on the edge, um, yeah. you know, be it Skid Row or, or, or you know, a battlefield, yeah. I, think, I think they kind of serve a purpose, almost like an enzyme on the floor of a, of a forest decomposing a, a leaf and bringing it back to soil they just don't know which job is theirs and which job isn't so it's almost like you're out there swimming with sharks but like on a spiritual level yeah know? that's an interesting point of view uh it may just have been some type of consciousness that didn't want us there didn't felt like we didn't belong there uh, or or that's its job to kind of dissolve dissolve yeah. men dissolve souls and like that yeah. out. It, it's strange but um I, I know you, you sent me a few pictures with some intense orb activity. Yeah. Um, was that at the uh, at that campsite, or is it just in various places? Yeah, so that was also at that location. Um, yeah, you know the whole orb phenomenon. It, it, preaching to the choir, I'm sure you know all about it, but uh, thought to be possibly spirits or some other type of entities on a on a different spiritual plane. Uh, in the, the photograph that was taken was right before a, uh, a night operation of a somewhat sensitive nature that uh, was, had the potential to be very, very high risk, high, high yield. Um, and uh, yeah, for whatever reason, that photograph is just littered with orbs. Yeah. So, um, and I'm glad you kind of brought that up, the, like the sense that something is about to happen or kind of that intuition. Um, it's another thing in and around that area, even outside of that compound. Um, and it's kind of hard to nail down exactly what that feeling is, but you kind of get like, um, I compare it to, you know, when, when you're a kid and you know there's about to be a fight, whether you're going to be in it or not, you can feel that charge. You know, there's a there's kind of like a rush. Some guys will actually try to move closer to whatever's happening because of it. Um, we could sense that a lot. Like that would happen a lot uh, right before a two way, right before a gunfight. Mm. Your ears start ringing, the kind of rush of blood. It sounds like a drum roll. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, part of like your your conscious mind knows. Um, based on the baseline of everything happening around you, there's a high potential for that to happen. But then even beyond that, there were instances where um, almost a feeling of like, all right, here we go. And then it would crank off. Oh, wow. Yeah. So just like a, a soup, like a sixth sense going on over there. It, yeah, something along those lines. Translators ever, did, like, did you ever have like candid conversations with them over, over the period of time that you were there and they'd open up to you about their supernatural beliefs or anything like that? Um, I mean, they're all pretty, pretty heavy, um, you know, Muslim based faith. Um, but some of the uh, militia members that we worked with, um, you know, local nationals that we trained, and then, you know, some of the more educated ones that were uniformed police officers, you, you kind of had different types with different beliefs, different worldviews. That makes um, sense. Yeah. But by and large, I would say, you know, they all kind of had some concept of, uh, you know, evil or evil entities or like day one with the whole, you know, being attacked by evil ghosts. 
guy. Um, it, it seemed to be a part of their understanding. And did you ever, um, were you ever uh, made aware of what the fate of that, uh, that poor guy who was being attacked by ghosts was? No, no, I don't know what went on with him. <laughs> That's pretty I'm intense. wandering the helmet somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty crazy, man. That's a good one. Um, well, yeah, man, I, yeah, I just appreciate you um, sharing that and shedding some light on that because if nothing else, it also gets me um, super interested in looking into the, just the history of that area and that yeah. river especially. Yeah. Pretty rich with activity. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if if, um, if you're ever out again, and you see see uh, like a desert creature or something, you want to make a, a, <laughs> a coffee table book out of. Yeah, I do live right up here in Joshua Tree, so. Yeah, I mean, shoot, you may be back on the show with a UFO sighting soon. You know, you're Who knows? right up in there. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great.